willpower. It's something we all wish we had more of, that magic ingredient that gives us the ability to control our impulses, to not eat that sweet treat that's stopping us from staying slim, that same resource that could be used to stop us from wasting another hour on our phones, and instead we could use the same resource to spring us into all kinds of new levels of productivity, to go out and exercise, to do that project we've been putting off for so long, and maybe, just maybe, go out and achieve our dreams. Willpower, it seems, is one of the most valuable resources we have, and yet it's something we all struggle to get a hold of. But what if I told you there was a way to get more willpower, and it was really, really easy? Because that's basically what ego depletion research says. So today we're going to talk about that. What is ego depletion? How does it work? And most importantly, is it too good to be true? Welcome back to Pete's Behavioral Insights and Theories, aka Pete's Bits. Let's go talk about ego depletion. So what is ego depletion? Ego depletion comes from famous researcher Roy Baumeister in a paper that he published in 1998. And I was born in 1998, so it's an idea that's literally as old as I am. And the idea was this. Baumeister proposed that willpower worked like a muscle. The more we'd used it before, the more tired it would be, and therefore the less willpower we would have available for later decisions. Now that's an idea that might resonate quite intuitively with a lot of you. The idea that if we get tired, we're less likely to be able to resist temptations later on in the day. But how can you test this experimentally? Well, in Baumeister's original 1998 paper, this was the procedure that participants went through. Participants were invited into a room with two plates on the table. One plate contained freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. And they knew they were freshly baked because those cookies were baked in the same room that they were sitting in. And so the air wafted of butter and sugar and chocolatey goodness. While the other plate simply contained red and white radishes. Now you can imagine which of these two plates is more tempting for the participant. But the catch was that the participants were randomly assigned to either be asked to only eat the cookies or only eat the radishes. Now once they'd been assigned which foods they were supposed to eat, the experimenter would leave the room and so those radish eating participants had to resist the temptation to eat those yummy yummy cookies and only eat those radishes. The idea being that this act of willpower, this resistance to temptation, would lead to depletion, that lead to a reduction in their willpower for the next task. Now what was that next task? Well the next task was a kind of drawing tracing task and it was really complicated. In fact, it was so complicated that it was actually impossible, but the participants didn't know this. So what Baumeister and his colleagues were interested in was with those people who had to eat the radishes, who had to exert some willpower and therefore become depleted, would they give up on the impossible task sooner than those people who got to eat those delicious cookies? Well, that's exactly what they found. So as you can see from this table, those people who ate the radishes gave up far sooner than those people who got to eat the cookies and sooner than those people who didn't eat anything at all. And this really was the first experimental evidence that maybe, maybe, willpower is a limited resource, like Baumeister hypothesized. But the saga of ego depletion really gets way more interesting almost a decade later when Baumeister and his colleagues publish another paper called Self-Control Relies on Glucose as a Limited Energy Source. Willpower is more than a metaphor. And in this paper, Baumeister and his colleagues make some really bold claims. The first claim is that acts of self-control actually expend energy, and you can measure this as a reduction in blood glucose in the body. So imagine you go to your local coffee shop and you see this delicious but unhealthy croissant in the window. By resisting the urge to buy it and eat it, you're actually expending blood glucose by doing so. Even though you're not doing anything that physical, just by the very nature of you having to resist this temptation, you're actually expending blood glucose. The second claim they made is that your blood sugar levels are actually a strong predictor of your willpower. In other words, when your blood sugars are running low, they can predict that your willpower will be lower for those decisions made at that time. But then finally, they made the biggest claim of them all. And this was the claim that you could actually replenish your willpower. And to replenish your willpower, it was actually super duper easy. All you had to do was drink a high glucose drink like Lucozade and suddenly your willpower would replenish and you'd be able to perform as if you had a lot more willpower. So whoa, that's an insane claim. So the researchers are saying here that in order to have more willpower, the resource that we need to make better shopping decisions, to live healthier lifestyles, to actually get the work done that we want to do, to make the plans that we've been putting off for so long and to achieve all of our long-term goals and the solution all this time was just Lucozade? It seems too good to be true and hard to believe, but honestly, the research that followed this finding 
is actually pretty convincing. Let's take a look at the research. For example, in this 2009 study, researchers asked customers to answer a series of complex questions before asking them for a charitable donation. Now, the point of them asking complex questions first is that it forces them to burn mental resources, that glucose that we talked about earlier. And by burning mental resources, they're supposed to become ego depleted. In other words, have less willpower to resist things later on. And sure enough, later on, when they expose these same participants to the foot in the door technique before asking a donation. Now, if you don't know what the foot in the door technique is, it's another nudge. Basically, you ask for a small request first before asking for a bigger request, i.e., can you sign our petition supporting our cause? And then you ask, can you make a donation to our cause? And you tend to get far bigger donations that way than if you just ask for donations straight up. And what the researchers found was truly remarkable. What they found was that those people who were asked the complex questions first were actually more susceptible to the foot in the door technique later on. Now that's a pretty profound finding for ego depletion because in essence, what these researchers are saying is that by using ego depletion, you can create this window of opportunity within your audience where your nudges are more potent and your audience is more susceptible to them. That's powerful stuff. And there were other studies that backed up this idea of glucose being linked to willpower too. For example, on a study by Kathleen Vose and Todd Heatherton, they got participants who were on a diet to come into the lab. Now dieting, as I'm sure you know intuitively, requires at least some level of willpower to be successful. You have to be able to resist cheating on your diet in order to lose the weight. So the researchers were interested in the question of whether they could ego deplete these dieters enough so that they would cheat more on their diet. So here's the procedure they went through. They got these dieters to watch an emotional movie, but they were instructed to try as hard as they could to resist expressing any emotion from the movie. So they had to watch it with plain expression and with no emotional response to whatever was being shown on the screen. Now, as you can imagine, this conscious effort to suppress emotion is asking them to use a lot of willpower to achieve it, and therefore it should be causing them to become ego depleted. Now, after watching the movie, they were then asked to do an ice cream taste test, but the researchers weren't actually interested in what the participants had to say about the quality of the ice cream. Instead, they were actually interested in how much ice cream these participants ate because they were dieters, right? Now, people on a diet shouldn't be eating a lot of ice cream, but yet what they found was that those dieters went through the depleting procedure first, those people who had to suppress their emotions from the movie actually cheated on their diet more and ate a greater quantity of ice cream than those who didn't go through the depleting procedure. Again, another score for ego depletion. And finally, a 2011 study conducted in Israel on judges. Judges, who you would hope would be objective all the time, showed that even judges have their decisions pretty heavily swayed by blood glucose levels. If you look at this graph, the dotted lines represent food breaks for the judges. And what we see is that after a food break, these judges give far more favorable rulings in favor of the defendant. This is because they were more likely to more seriously consider the individual cases and facts, a task that you could argue requires a lot more willpower to do. Also, the number of favorable rulings they gave decreased as the day went on, which is correlated with blood glucose levels as well. So, are you convinced? Do you think that ego depletion is real? Well, if you do, then hold your horses because the story still gets a little bit more complicated. You see, ego depletion, unfortunately, has also become a victim of the replication crisis in psychology. This problem of many old studies and findings failing replication tests later on. Let's take a look at some of the most important papers. So this 2010 meta-analysis of ego depletion studies concluded that ego depletion really must be real. But then six years later, this 2016 meta-analysis found no significant evidence of ego depletion being real at all. But then again, this other 2016 meta-analysis, so it came out in the same year, found that there was a small group of studies that actually had a big enough sample size to mean anything. And unfortunately, that's pretty rare in our field. And what they found was that those studies with big enough sample sizes did show evidence of ego depletion. And what complicates the story more is you may have heard of this other study by Carol Dweck on ego depletion. Now, if you don't know who Carol Dweck is, she's the person who brought us the idea of a growth mindset, which has become really, really popular these days. And what Carol Dweck and her colleagues found on their study on ego depletion was that it wasn't your actual blood glucose levels that mediated whether or not you would have more or less willpower, 
but instead it was your belief that willpower was a limited resource that mediated it. So what they claimed was that if you believed that willpower was an infinite resource that never got depleted, that you would not show any ego depletion effects, and that ego depletion only holds true for those people who believe that willpower is limited. Then we come full circle to Baumeister, who first discovered ego depletion way back in 1998, and he responded to Carol Dweck's study with a study of his own that found that this effect was only temporary. So if you didn't believe in ego depletion, then yes, you could mitigate the effects of ego depletion for one task, but then if you were asked to do a second self-control task afterwards, you failed miserably, further supporting the notion of ego depletion. So depending on which combination of studies you've heard of before, you may or may not believe that ego depletion is real. So I hope after watching this video, you now have a more complete understanding of the debate around ego depletion. So let me know in the comments below this video, do you think ego depletion is real or is it all a load of malarkey? Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye. But wait, before you go, this is Peter editing Peter from the future a few days later after recording that initial part of the video. And the reason why I'm recording this segment is because it's come to my attention that there is a brand new study on ego depletion. In fact, it's a big pre-registered multi-site study on ego depletion. So basically multiple different ego depletion procedures taking place at different universities at the same time and then coming together to form this big super study on ego depletion and shout out to Robert Metcalf from The Behavioralist for posting about this on Facebook and bringing it to my attention. But what this study found in this big super study was that there was no evidence of ego depletion according to their data. No evidence of ego depletion. In fact, they were four times more likely to find that there was no ego depletion effect than they were to find that there was an ego depletion effect. So you come to Pete's Bits for the latest in behavioral science research, doesn't get more recent than this. This was literally published a few weeks ago and it finds no evidence of ego depletion. So more fuel for the debate. Let me know what you think in the comments below.